All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take 2 Kings chapter 17, the end of the northern kingdom. All right, so we're going to talk about the small, the uh, the fall of Samaria, the fall of Israel, right, and the evil reign of Hosea. We'll let's just jump into the first two verses. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, the son of Elah, came, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. All right, so, Hosea, the son of Elah. We last saw Hosea in Second Kings chapter 15, verse 30, as the man who led a conspiracy against Pekah the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, right? And after a successful assassination, Hosea took the throne and started his own brief dynasty. And Hosea was an evil man, but by no means was he the worst of the kings of Israel, right? Sadly, his bloody overthrow of the preceding king and violent ascent to power did not make him unusually evil among the kings of Israel, right? So he was one among many bad apples. And he seems not to have inaugurated or continued the anti Yahwistic practices for which Israel itself was condemned. And this reminds us that judgment may not come at the height of sin. When God judges a nation or a culture, he has the big picture in view here. And for that reason, the actual events of judgment may come when things are not as bad in a relative sense. So it is not that the last stand that exhausts the hourglass, nor the last stroke of the axe that falls the tree. So here, right? So Hosea became king in 732 BC, the 12th year of Ahaz. Ahaz's reign, which began in 744 BC, included nine years as a vice regent from, nine, from 744 to 735. Four years as co-regent with his father, Jotham, from 735 to 732. And 16 years as principal king from 732 to 715. So Hosea began his reign of nine years in the 20th year of Jotham, chapter 15, verse 30, which was 732 B.C., Jotham's 20 years, right, from 750 to 732 B.C. And that included his 16-year reign from 750 to 735. And four years as co-regent with Ahaz from 735 to 732. And Jotham's reign from 750 to 732 appears to be about 18 or 19 years. But it was considered 20 years because he reigned 18 full years and parts of two other years. Okay? Follow me there. All right. Verses 3 through 4, Hosea's feudal resistance against Assyria. And Shalamanzer, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hosea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. So in the pattern of Mehahim before him in 2 Kings chapter 15 verses 17 through 22, Hosea accepted the status of vassal unto the king of Assyria. And basically if he paid his money and did as the king of Assyria pleased, then he would be allowed to continue on the throne of Israel, right? He sold himself out. And Hosea thought that he had a strategic opportunity when the new king came from the Assyrian throne, but he was wrong. When Tiklath Pileser III died in 727 BC and was succeeded by his own son Shalamanzer V from 727 to 722 BC, the time seemed ripe for certain western states to renounce their vassal status. Moreover, a seemingly important ally lay southward in the delta of Egypt. Right, so King Hosea, uh, King Hosea, hoped to find help among the Egyptians, who were in constant power struggle with the Assyrian Empire. On account of this conspiracy and the failure to pay the yearly tribute money, Hosea was imprisoned by the king of Assyria. And as we might expect among the kings of Israel, this northern kingdom, Hosea did not look to the Lord for help. He looked to Egypt, a pagan empire. And therefore Hosea said of him, As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Hosea chapter 10 verse 7. So the reference to So, king of Egypt, is probably better understood as a reference to a place, uh, Sais, which was at the time the capital of Egypt, thus understood. Verse 4 would read, He had sent his envoys to Sais, even to the king of Egypt. Right? That's how it would actually read. 
All right, so Shalemanjah V from 727 to 722 BC had succeeded his father Tiglath Pileser III on the throne of Assyria. And so he attacked Samaria because Hoshea had failed to pay the yearly tribute he owed as a vassal. And instead of paying his taxes, Hoshea tried to make a treaty with So, all right, Asorkin IV uh, from 727 to 716 BC, the king of Egypt. And this was a foolish mistake because Egypt did not and apparently could not help Hoshea. And Shalemanzer discovered Hoshea's plan to revolt. He marched on Israel and he took Hoshea prisoner. And Shalemanzer then subdued the remaining territory of the northern kingdom. All right, verses 5 through 6, the northern kingdom of Israel is finally conquered by the Assyrians. So things are not looking good. So now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years in the ninth year of Hoshea. The king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. So this was a long, dedicated campaign to finally crush the rebellious kingdom of Israel, this northern kingdom, who had defied the power of the Assyrian Empire. And though it took a three-year siege, it was worth it to the Assyrians. So the fact that it took Assyria that long to break Samaria's resistance is a testimony to the good wall Omri and Ahab had built around the capital city. And this shows us that when God brings his judgment, he may use human instruments to do it. So when Samaria finally fell and the northern kingdom was conquered, the Assyrians implemented their policy towards conquered nations. They deported all but the very lowest classes back to the key cities of their empire, either to train and utilize the talented or to enslave the able. So 200 years, 19 years, uh, 200 years and 19 kings after the time of Solomon, the last king over a united Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel fell. And it was not because the God of Israel was unable to help them, but because they had so forsaken the God and ignored his guidance and correction that he finally stopped actively protecting them and let them rot and degrade according to their desire. He gave them exactly what they wanted, as per the agreement in Deuteronomy. Right? Pay attention to that. They agreed to that. And God takes those agreements seriously. So as they carried Israel away to Assyria, they followed their typical custom. When the Assyrians depopulated and exiled a conquered community, they led the captives away on journeys of hundreds of miles. With the captives naked and attached together with a system of strings and fish hooks pierced to their lower lip, God can make sure that they were led in this humiliating manner through the broken walls of their own conquered cities. In Amos chapter 4 verses 2 through 3. And this shows another principle of God's judgment. When it comes, it is often humiliating and degrading. And it seems that Sargon II, the brother and successor of Shalemanzer, finished this siege, and or he at least took credit for it. And the men of Samaria with their king were so hostile to me and consorted together not to carry out their vassal obligations and bring tribute to me, so they fought me. And I clashed with them and took as booty 27,280 people with their chariots and their gods in whom they trusted. And I incorporated 200 chariots into my army, and the rest of the people I made to dwell within Assyria. And I restored the city of Samaria and made it greater than before, inscribed the prisms of Sargon II from Nimrud, cited in Wiseman. All right. So it took Shalemanzer three years to capture Samaria, and he took it in Hoshea's ninth year from 722 BC and deported many of the people to Assyria, chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. And the Israelites were sent to various parts of the Assyrian Empire. So let's look at Israel's termination as a nation. After just over two centuries, the northern kingdom of Israel ceased to exist as a nation. Over two centuries, right? 931 to 722 BC. Seven over 20 kings were assassinated, and all were judged to be evil by God. All right, so the reasons for the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. So the rest of this chapter is spent in vindicating the divine providence and justice, showing the reason why God permitted such a desolation to fall on a people who had been so long his peculiar children. So verse 7, they disregarded the God of their redemption. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods. Uh, feared can also be rendered respected. So, in the following verses, the divine historian explains the fundamental reasons for conquering and captivity of the northern kingdom. At the root, it was a problem with sin, and it wasn't a geopolitical change or social cause. It was just sin. 
So they feared other gods, and the central act of redemption in the Old Testament history, God brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt, and remembrance of this act alone should prompt Israel to be a single-hearted commitment to the Lord. Yet they did not remember this, and instead they feared other gods, breaking the covenant God made with his people. Right? They agreed to this covenant promise. So, however, the kingdom of Israel had feared other gods since their founding some 200 years before this. This shows us another principle of God's judgment. It is often a long time in coming because God holds back his judgment as long as possible. All right, verse 8. They conformed themselves to the godless nations around them and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from the, before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. So before Israel occupied Canaan in the days of Joshua, the promised land was populated by a degenerate pagan people who practiced the worst kinds of idolatry and human sacrifice imaginable. One of the fundamental sins of Israel was that they followed in these ancient Canaanite ways. And God cast out the Canaanite nations in the days of Joshua because of these sins, specifically. And it says so. And now he had cast out the northern kingdom of Israel for the same sins, right? And Israel wasn't special. They would get punished for the same thing. And God's judgment was not against the ancient Canaanites because of their race or ethnicity. It was because of their conduct. And as Israel shared the same conduct, then they would share the same judgment. And that's exactly what happened. And it's a little difficult to say if what they made referred to to the other gods mentioned in the previous verse or to the statutes mentioned in this verse, right? Either is valid or true. Men make both their laws and their idols after their own ingenuity and desire. And that's what's true with the um, most of mainstream Christianity today. We'll make up our own rules instead of just looking at the word of God. So the defeat and uh, deportation of Israel took place because of Israelites' sin against God in view of his miraculous liberating redemption of the nation from Egyptian bondage. Their sin was even more serious. And how ironic that the last king, Hosea, had sought help from Egypt in verse 4 when 724 years earlier in 1446 BC, Israel had finally escaped from Egypt. All right, verses 9 through 12, their secret and openly practice idolatry. Also, the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. And they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from a watchtower to a fortified city. And they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. And they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger, for they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Right? So rebellion and sin cloud the judgment of men, and clearly the judgment of Israel was affected, and their judgment was impaired enough to think that they could sin secretly against the God who sees everything. There are no such thing as secret sins. God is everywhere, <laughs> at all times, in all places. He is the one that inhabits eternity. He has all knowledge. So these were <laughs> these were places of uh, these high places were unauthorized and idolatrous sacrifice, as were these sacred pillars. Right. Uh, anytime you, talk, you see these groves spoken of, it's actually trees carved in a phallic images, and that was for the uh, uh, prostitution and fertility gods. So the divine historian repeats this theme, right? Like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. The same sins that brought judgment upon the Canaanites also brought judgment on the northern kingdom of Israel, right? So they weren't special. They got it too. So idols did not forsake the Lord completely, but worshipped other gods. Right? Idols in verse 12 also see Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. They compromised with their pagan neighbors and followed the practices of the very nations God dispossessed because of their wickedness. All right, verses 13 through 15, they rejected the repeated warnings from God. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I have commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffen their necks, like the necks of their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant, and he had made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he had testified against them 
them, and they followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So in love, God sent prophets to the northern and southern kingdoms. Their message was a warning against the sins that corrupted God's people and separated them from their God. They invited God's people with the theme, Turn from your evil ways. So God sent these messengers to help Israel and to spare them the judgment that would come if they didn't turn from their evil ways. Yet, God's people became more stubborn when God brought this call to repentance and they sunk deeper into sin. So when God brings judgment, he first brings warning, and often many warnings over a long period. And it's only after these warnings are rejected that judgment comes. And their sin was first against the law, but finally it was against patient love. And refused, they stiffened their necks. This is refused to submit their neck to the yoke of God's precepts. It's a metaphor from stubborn oxen that make their necks hard or stiff and won't bow, you know, they won't bow to the yoke. So the NIV will translate this, you know, they followed idols, became idolaters. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. The NASB has it, they followed vanity and became vain. The original is more accurate at this point. They worship emptiness and became empty, right? We become what we worship very clearly. And the word here is hebel, meaning air, delusion, or vanity. And the idea is that they become like the gods they worshipped, right? And they bowed down to nothingness and became nothing, right? Is the world cold and empty and heartless and selfish? If you worship the world, then you too will become cold and selfish and heartless, right? If you want to be loving uh, like the living God, then to be a Christian is to become Christ-like, to be like Christ. You will become like him. And that is what we strive for in his likeness. So their worship involved wicked behavior that angered the Lord. And you can see chapter 13, verse 3, chapter 17, verse 17. Their idolatry involved disobeying a plainly revealed prohibition by God. And God sent the prophets Ahijah, Elijah, uh, Micaiah, Elisha, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Shemaiah, Joel, Isaiah, and Micah to the southern kingdom of Judah. And later on, he will be sending Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. And every prophet warned the people of both kingdoms what would take place if they didn't return to God and forsake their evil ways. And the Israelites deliberately rejected the covenant God had made with their ancestors as well as his decrees. So they took on the characteristics of the idols which they first put in their lives. And you can see Psalm 135 verses 15 through 18 for this. They imitated the godless nations around them in spite of God's order not to follow their example. And they practiced the things God had told them not to do for a reason. Right? Not just be out of spite. There's a reason behind it. To keep you from falling into evil. Yet, people, people say, no, nope, you don't know what you're talking about. I'll just do it my own way. And indeed they do, and indeed they fail every time. All right, verses 16 through 23, they forsook God and served idols until judgment finally came. And so they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molded image and two calves, made a wooden image, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them from his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Also Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they had made. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of the plunderers, until he had cast them out from his sight. And he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord, and made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. And they did not depart from them, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. And as he had said by his servants and prophets, so Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. So they made for themselves a molded image and two calves. This refers to the infamous sin of Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 through 29. This state-sponsored idolatry did not immediately ruin the kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel lasted as an independent nation for another 200 years following the time of Jeroboam. Yet it certainly was the beginning of the end, right? And uh, the cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire. This is child sacrifice. This refers to the abdominal worship of the idol Molech, to whom children were burned in sacrifice. And so they practice witchcraft. The northern tribes embrace the same occultic practices that the Canaanite tribes before them. And collectively, these great sins of idolatry provoked God to anger. 
right? Same thing happening in America today, by and at large, right? Do we have Molech? No, we don't. We have abortion. Even worse, instead of to a pagan god, we get rid of kids just out of inconvenience, right? 99% are out of inconvenience, all right? Uh, but heaven forbid, you know, if you want to sit with murder on your shoulders, then by all means, uh, people are going to get exactly what they want. And that's all through scripture. Like, you want to sit in a cesspool of sin, then that's exactly what's going to happen. And if America keeps going on her way, America is going to get what it asked for. So this was the end of the ten northern tribes as the independent kingdom. When they were dispersed by the Assyrians, some assimilated into other cultures, but others kept their Jewish identity as exiles in other lands. Yet it is a mistake to think that these ten northern tribes are lost. For back in the days of Jeroboam, in his original break with the southern kingdom of Judah, the legitimate priests and Levites who lived in the northern ten tribes did not like Jeroboam's idolatry. They, along with others who set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, moved from the northern kingdom of Israel to the southern kingdom of Judah in 2 Chronicles chapter 11 verses 13 through 16. So actually the southern kingdom of Judah contained Israelites from all the ten tribes. Considering all this we can say that the ten northern tribes were not lost and they certainly did not migrate to Britain in accord with some British Israelite theories. Some in particular, uh, in particular the godly of that day migrated to the southern kingdom of Judah in the days of Jeroboam the first. Some assimilated into other cultures and some kept their Jewish culture and identity in the lands of their exile. So, spiritually speaking, Judah was more faithful to God than the northern kingdom of Israel. They had their own problems still, but they weren't nearly as bad as northern kingdom. Yet they also began to imitate their sinful neighbors to the north over time. And Judah had the lesson right in front of them. The conquered nation of Israel was evidence of what happened when hearts turned away from God. Yet they ignored these plain lessons and imitated the sins of Israel regardless. Right? And this, we have thousands of years of history but if we keep going the same way then you better bet that america too will cave at some point and we'll do it to ourselves that's the thing it won't even be anybody else doing it to it we will if america sits in sin and our church continues going against the word of god then we will destroy ourselves essentially that's exactly what's happening right now over 80 social metrics have gotten worse since the 1960s not a single one has gotten better uh, the summary of Israel's sin is simply that they were given over to idolatry and they worshipped the true God in a false way and then began to also worship uh, false gods. So forsaking all the God's commands, they fashioned these two calves out of metal and they worshipped them at Dan and Bethel in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 28 and 29 and Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 14 through 19. In Samaria, the capital city, Israel set up a pole that symbolized the Canaanite fertility goddess Asherah in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 6. They worshipped the planets and stellar constellations in chapter 21, verse 5, chapter 23, verses 4 through 5, with their neighbors who practiced astrology in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19 for that. They also worshipped Baal, the male fertility fertility god of the Near East. They even followed the brutal practice of offering their children as human sacrifice to placate the gods in 2 Kings chapter 16 verse 3 and Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 10. And they practiced divination or witchcraft and sorcery that consulted evil spirits in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 10 and 11. And in doing all these things, the Israelites sold themselves over to sin, thereby provoking the Lord to anger. And you can see 2 Kings chapter 13 verse 3 and chapter 17 verse 11. Because they were so rebellious, God in anger at their attitude disciplined his people by deporting them from his presence right out of the land in verse 23 where he had promised to dwell with them and exile was one of the curses or judgments that God said he would bring on the nation if the people disobeyed him in Deuteronomy 28 verses 45 through 48 all right, so even the southern kingdom disobeyed the Lord, and many Judahites uh, imitated the Israelites that adopted the practices their brethren had introduced, and because of this, God punished the southern kingdom as well. And he sent Judah affliction and let the people suffer at the hands of other nations that plundered them until they, were, uh, they also were led captive out of their own land. So the statements in verses 18 to 20 are editorial comments inserted by the writer of 2 Kings after Judah had been taken into captivity. And God tore Israel away from Judah, the house or dynasty of David, in Rehoboam's day because of the sins of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 9 to 13. The Israelites then made Jeroboam their king, and he enticed the nation away from God and caused them to worship the two golden calves in 2 Kings 17 verses 16. So for these reasons, flagrant idolatry 
obstinate disobedience, star worship, child sacrifice, occultic practices. Um, the Israelites were removed from the land that God had given them as their home into exile into Assyria. And they were still there when the writer penned these words down. All right, verse 24 through 26. God warns the foreigners who are resettled in Samaria. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, uh, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharavim, and placed them into the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. And it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. And so they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the rituals of God of the land. Therefore he sent lions among them, and indeed they are killing them because they do not know the rituals of the God of the land. So the policy of the Assyrian Empire was to remove rebellious, resistant people and to resettle their former lands with people from other parts of the empire. And not only did the Assyrian monarchs hope to make the re the repopulated and reconstituted districts more manageable, but they hoped to train and encourage the citizenry to transfer their loyalties to the Assyrian Empire. And this shows that there was not only something special about the Kingdom of Israel, but also something special about the land of Israel. God demanded to be feared among the people of the land, even if they came from other nations. And perhaps because many unburied bodies still remained after the bloody warfare and due to depopulation of the land, voracious lions began to roam freely through the area. And Zechariah chapter 2 verse 12 will tell us that the land of Israel is a holy land, and God regards it as something special and will hold accountable those who live there and do not fear him. And hereby also God asserted his own right and sovereignty over that land and made them to understand that neither the Israelites were cast out nor they brought into that land their valor or strength, but by God's providence. So these Assyrian officials seem to know what was recently conquered kingdom of Israel did not know, that they had to honor the God of Israel. Yet any faith in God among these resettled people was founded in simple fear of the lions, le leading to an inadequate relationship with God. So he did send lions among them, and it was these lions that converted them. Their teeth and fangs and fiery eyes and the thunders of the roars converted them. And they must have a God to deliver them, and they could not bear the lions. Therefore, they must fear the Lord who could send the lions, and who perhaps could cease to send them. Now, dear friends, always be somewhat different of your own conversion if you can only trace it only and solely to motives of terror. So the king of Assyria was probably Sargon II from 722 to 705 BC. Chalamanjah V died either during or shortly after the siege of Samaria. The policy of Assyria toward the conquered lands was to deport many of the most influential inhabitants and then import many leading Assyrians to take their places. Sargon brought people from Babylon, uh, Kutta, the city northeast of Babylon, Ava between Anna and the Harbor River, verse 6 on the Euphrates River, and Hamath, the city in Aram on the Orontes River, and uh, Sepharavim, people from Sippar and the Euphrates above Babylon, and settled them in towns in Israel, now called the Assyrian province of Samaria. And they took leadership in the province and settled down in various towns, and this planted the roots of what later became known as the Samaritans, sometimes called the half-Jews. So because the people didn't worship the Lord, he sent lions among them. And the lions already in Israel might have multiplied more quickly because of the reduced human population. God sometimes will use wild animals as his agents of judgment. And you can look at 1 Kings chapter 13 verses 23 through 26, chapter 20 verse 36, and they killed some of these people. So the Assyrians interpreted this as a punishment from God of Israel, whom they viewed as a deity who needed to be placated. And since they didn't know how to appease him, they reported the situation to Sargon. All right, verse 27 through 33, a religion for Samaria is established. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Send there one of the priests whom you brought from there, and let him go and dwell there, and let him teach the rituals of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. However, every nation continued to make gods of its own, and put them in the shrines of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities which the, where they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Sakoth benoth the men of Kuth made Nergal, the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made uh, Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sephirvites burned their children in fire to Adremelech and Anamelech, the gods of uh, Zeravaim, 
And so they feared the Lord, and from every class they appointed for themselves priests of the high places, who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. And they feared the Lord, yet they served their own gods, according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. So the priesthood of the kingdom of Israel was corrupt, but the king of Assyria did not know and was not interested in the pure religion of Israel. Therefore, this nameless corrupt priest taught the new inhabitants of the land a corrupt religion. And certainly it had elements of true faith in it, just like Christianity does today. But at the same time, it was corrupted by the centuries of state-sponsored idolatry that reigned in Israel. So the priests for hire brought in by the Assyrians did not tell the new inhabitants of the land that they must only worship the Lord God of Israel. Right? Interesting. And they did not teach it because coming from Israel, he didn't believe it. And so this described the pagan peoples of, uh, that the Assyrians brought in to populate the area of the northern king of, kingdom of Israel. And it gave measure of respect to the God of Israel. After all, they didn't want to be eaten by the lions, yet they also served their own gods and picked and chose among religious and and spiritual beliefs as it pleased them, much like the church today. We'll just pick and choose what's our favorite stuff. This accurately describes the pagan peoples who repopulated Israel. It accurately described the northern kingdom of Israel before they were conquered and exiled. And this accurately describes the common religious belief in the modern world today. And are you sure that this is not a true description of your own position, right? You pay an outward deference to God by attending his house, by acknowledging his day, and while you are really prostrating yourself before other shrines. So it is not a worldly piety or pious worldliness that the the current religion of England, right? They live among godly people, and God chastens them, and therefore they fear him but not enough to give their hearts to him. They seek out a trimming teacher who is not too precise and plain spoken, and they settle down comfortably to a mongrel faith, half truth, half error, and a mongrel worship, half dead form, and half orthodoxy. Right? So let me be right, and let there be no mistake about it. But do not let me try to be both right and wrong, washed and filthy, white and black, a child of God and a child of Satan. So the priest moved to Bethel, and if this had been his former dwelling place, he was probably one of the priests involved in worshiping the golden calf there. And each national group of Assyrian immigrants set up their own shrines for the worship of their own pagan gods wherever they settled, using the high places where the Israelites had frequented. And the national groups in verse 24 and their idols are listed in verses 30 and 31, along with some of their pagan practices, such as human sacrifice. So the writer wrote that these people worship the Lord and also their gods. This syncretism was forbidden by the Lord in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3. And 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 24 through 33 shows how the Samaritan people came into being. The Samaritans, racially a mixture of Israelites and other various ancient Near Eastern people, were despised by the full-blooded Jews in John chapter 4 verse 9. Possibly, however, the Samaritans were the pure descendants of the Israelites who also remained in the land. All right, verses 34 through 41, the continuance of this false religion, right? Religion is never spoken of in a positive manner. You're going to note every time man does something with religion, it is always in a negative manner. All right, 34 through 41. So to this day, they continued practicing the former rituals. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law and commandment which the Lord had commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them, but the Lord, who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power and an outstretched arm. Him you shall fear, him you shall worship, and to him you shall offer sacrifice. And the statutes, the ordinances, the law, and the commandment which he wrote for you, you shall be careful to observe it forever, and you shall not fear other gods. And the covenant which I have made with you, you shall not forget, nor shall you feel other, fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hand of your enemies. However, they didn't obey, but they followed their former rituals. Right? Watch out for rituals. So these nations feared the Lord, yet they served the carved images. Also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their fathers did even to this day. Interesting. Does that not describe what's happening today as well? Weird. So the area of the northern kingdom of Israel was not reoccupied by Judah before their own subjugation and conquest by the Babylonian Empire. This mixed religion first promoted the Assyrians 
um, continued for many centuries in Samaria, even unto the New Testament times. And it seems that God was more lenient with these Samaritans of corrupt belief than he was with disobedient Israel. This teaches us that those with more revelation from God are held to a stricter account before him, right? We have been given an even more, you know, higher revelation from God. The fact that we've got the whole picture, right? So through all of history, each time a little bit more information comes, God holds them to a higher standard, higher standard. Well, how much higher standard do we have as opposed to, say, Adam and Eve, right? We have way more of the picture unraveled for us today than they did and so forth or Abraham, or Moses, right? Yet, Second Chronicles chapter 30, verses 10-19 through 19, will show us that in the days of King Hezekiah of Judah, that there were some worshippers of the true God among the area that was formerly known as the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and some responded to his invitation to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. So the writer states this, right? The Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hand of your enemies. The writer writes this to remind us that if Israel had been faithful, even moderately faithful, to her to their covenant with God, then they would still stand, and God would have delivered them from all their enemies. Instead, they were conquered by the Assyrian Empire after their own self destruction in sin and rebellion. So God changed Jacob's name to Israel to show that he and his descendants were to become a distinct people in the world. And this distinctiveness was being broken down by the Samaritans. The distinction distinctiveness is further highlighted by a loose quotation in verse 35 through 39 of several commands from the Mosaic Law. And you'll note Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, and verse 23, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 and 34, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6, 15 and 32, chapter 6, verses 12, chapter 7, verse 11, and verse 25. Right? And that ties up chapter 17. Next time we will get into chapter 18 from Second Kings. We're going to talk about Hezekiah's good reign. Thank you for joining me.